as staunch Nazi and former SS man Walter Rauf is laid to rest in South America. His old comrades give Nazi salutes over the grave. Ralph was a war criminal, a man whose hands were steeped in blood. Yet, like thousands of others, he escaped justice to live out his days far from the crimes he committed in the Second World War, and totally unrepentant. What exactly did you do during the war? During the war, I did my duty in the German Navy and other services, like every officer, soldier, citizen in all countries engaged in the war. One of the other services to which Ralph belonged, the SS, continues to hold regular reunions. Some, like Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, were eventually brought to trial for crimes against humanity. Others went scot-free. Was this the inevitable result of the chaos in which Europe found itself at the end of the most catastrophic war humanity has ever suffered? Or, as some believe, was there a hidden hand behind the escape of so many SS men? an organization which not only masterminded their escape, but was also dedicated to the establishment of a Fourth Reich. The SS were the elite of Adolf Hitler's thousand-year Reich, the booted, black-uniformed guardians of Nazi ideology and racial purity. During the Second World War, they were the scourge of Europe and occupied Russia. SS is an abbreviation for Schutzstaffel, the German for protection squads. Its leader, Heinrich Himmler, was responsible for providing Hitler's personal bodyguard in the early days of the Nazi party. From these seedy beginnings, the SS evolved into the most powerful arm of the Nazi administration. When Hitler came to power in 1933, Himmler's SS numbered some 50,000 men. The SS provided the guards at the concentration camps, which were springing up all over Germany. Their uniforms sported a death's head badge. An offshoot of the SS, the security police, or SD, commanded by the ruthless Reinhard Heydrich, gave Himmler an instrument of political terror. Members of the Gestapo, the secret police force set up by Hermann Goering, also belonged to the SS. By 1939, under Himmler's leadership, the SS had become a state within a state. It was also prepared for war. The Waffen-SS was its military wing, and its formations fought alongside the German army. Himmler saw the Waffen-SS as the historical successor to the Teutonic Knights, combining Aryan virtue with fanatical loyalty to Hitler. By the end of the war, nearly a million men had fought in the Waffen-SS. Many of them were foreign volunteers. SS men also filled the ranks of the Einsatzgruppen, or operations groups, which roamed the rear areas during the invasion of Russia, executing hundreds of thousands of Jews and other non-Aryan elements in German-occupied territory. In 12 months, just one of these groups murdered 90,000 men. 
women and children. The killing became more systematic after a conference held in February 1942 in the Berlin suburb of Wannsee. The death camps run by the SS were to provide the final solution to the Jewish problem. Most of these camps were in eastern Poland. From all over occupied Europe, cattle trucks crammed with their human cargo trundled to their terrible destinations. Treblinka, Majdanek and Auschwitz. At Auschwitz, the trains were welcomed by the dapper figure of Captain Josef Mengele, the camp's senior medical officer. Mengele bestrode the selection wrap, humming snatches from his favorite operas. With the conductor's baton, he directed able-bodied arrivals to the right. This meant life, for a while at least. Those who went to the left, the old, the ill, pregnant women and children, went straight to the gas chambers. Mengele's was the last smiling face they saw on earth. Mengele also chose guinea pigs for barbarous medical experiments which had no scientific justification. He was obsessed with twins, and many helpless tots suffered torture at his hands. These are the lucky ones who escaped the clutches of the doctor, who was described by his colleagues as the perfect SS man. By the beginning of 1945, it was clear even to Heinrich Himmler that the war was lost. The Red Army was on the move again, in a huge drive which was to take it almost to the gates of Berlin. As the Third Reich collapsed in ruins, the men responsible for these crimes faced retribution. Hermann Goering surrendered to the Allies and was led away into captivity. For some, justice was swift and summary. In November 1945, the Nazi leadership was tried for war crimes at Nuremberg. The Nuremberg trial lasted nearly a year. In the Russian zone of occupied Germany, retribution came more swiftly. Many former SS men and Nazi officials were simply taken out and shot. The British and Americans were more circumspect. Post-war Germany could not be run without the help of former Nazis. Many of them could also provide useful intelligence in the new Cold War, which was threatening to break out with the Soviet Union. The Central Intelligence Agency, founded in 1947, relied heavily on the expertise of men like Reinhard Galen, who had been the German Army's intelligence chief on the Eastern Front. When it came to the smaller fry, the Americans and the British went through the motions. Punishment was meted out to the sadistic female camp guards at Belsen. Its commandant, Josef Kramer, was executed. SS General Karl Wolf served only a week of a four-year sentence for war crimes, but in 1962 was re-arrested and sentenced to 15 years for his role in the deportation of Jews to the death camps. Amidst the administrative chaos of post-war Germany, the Allies eventually tried 200,000 people for war crimes. Many received only token punishments. From 1948, the Allied pursuit of war criminals was wound down. In these circumstances, it was possible for a wanted man like Josef Mengele to melt into the background. He evaded capture by working as a farmhand in Bavaria. But the risk of arrest remained. However, with the right connections and a degree of luck, an SS man on the run could obtain a false international Red Cross passport, an entry visa to a foreign country, and ultimately, a job in an emigre community. There was also an organization to help him. Its name was Odessa. This acronym did not stand for the Russian city on the Black Sea, but for the organization of former members of the SS. Like the Mafia, those who belong to Odessa claim that it does not exist. But like the Cosa Nostra, 
Odessa enjoys an amoeba-like existence, forming and reforming to fit the occasion or need. One man has always been convinced of the reality of Odessa and of the role it has played in helping war criminals to escape justice. He is Simon Wiesenthal, an Austrian Jew who survived the death camps to devote his life to tracking down war criminals from his Jewish documentation center in Vienna. Wiesenthal insists that Odessa is more than an association of old comrades. He believes that it was founded in the late 1940s by a group of high-ranking SS men and leaders of German war industry. Odessa's purpose was to establish escape routes, later dubbed rat lines, down which men like Mengele could be ferried to safety. This required money, and Odessa had lots of it, the fruit of wartime looting and exploitation. In the war, the SS had turned death into an industry. German arms manufacturers had paid for the services of slave labor from the death camps. Auschwitz was surrounded by factories where prisoners were worked to death. The SS then sold the shoes and personal possessions of the people they had killed. Even the gold fillings torn from their mouths and the rags ripped from their backs. Looted art treasures hidden in mine shafts, added to the hoard. The Allies found Hermann Goering's private collection, but many masterpieces simply vanished into thin air. Laundered into dollars and sterling, the SS treasure was deposited in discreet Swiss banks under false names and the accounts of bogus companies. The complex business of moving the money out of Germany was masterminded by the brilliant banker Hjalmar Schacht, who had served as Hitler's economics minister in the 1930s. Schacht had been tried and acquitted of war crimes at Nuremberg. Odessa's wealth enabled it to establish three escape routes for wanted war criminals from the North German port of Bremen to the Italian port of Genoa. From Bremen to Rome, where the Vatican and the International Red Cross, either wittingly or unwittingly, came to the aid of Nazi escapees, and from Austria into Italy. These were the jumping off points to Odessa's favored haven of South America, where there were well-established and welcoming German communities and a wide selection of military dictatorships unlikely to ask questions about fugitives from the Third Reich. In 1944, the Luftwaffe dive bomber ace Hans Ulrich Rudel was ordered by Martin Bormann, Hitler's secretary, to fly a number of top secret missions to Argentina, carrying tons of gold and crates of securities and art treasures. Although he was not a war criminal, Rudel was a staunch Nazi. After the war, he settled in Argentina and worked for the country's president, Juan Perón, as an aviation consultant. In Argentina, German officers trained Perón's army, which continued to wear German uniforms. German technicians ran Argentine industry, and millions in capital was invested in Argentine banks. Buenos Aires became the south terminal port for Odessa. Germans took over hotels and boarding houses, supplied SS men with identity papers, and bribed officials to turn a blind eye as the fugitives settled into a new life in South America. The first operational head of Odessa was the swashbuckling Otto Skorzeny, a Waffen SS man and Hitler's favorite commander. In September 1943, Skorzeny commanded the crack Gliderborn unit, which rescued the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini from his mountaintop prison on the Gran Sasso in the Abruzzi Mountains. After the war, Skorzeny was tried at Nuremberg as a war criminal and acquitted. He secured his freedom by trading information with US intelligence chiefs. Thereafter, Skorzeny remained an influential player in the world of Cold War intelligence. He was based in Madrid, and was close to the exiled Juan Perón.
In the 1950s, Skortseni supplied Egypt with German rocket scientists in an attempt to develop a long-range missile aimed at Israel. In 1952, Skortseni became Hjalmar Schacht's son-in-law. Schacht was now the head of a private banking empire based in Hamburg. Schacht held Odessa's purse strings while Skortseni organized the rat lines. In Skortseni's hands, the rat lines became a highly efficient network based on a chain of safe houses manned by a maximum of five and a minimum of three people. The handlers knew of only two other shelters, the one from which the escapees came and the one to which they were going. The Vatican was another staging post for refugees, many of them former Nazis. A US State Department report made in 1947 and classified as top secret until 1984, named the Vatican as the single largest organization involved in the illegal movement of immigrants. The report concluded that the Vatican had applied heavy pressure to the foreign missions of Latin American countries to adopt a favorable attitude to the admission of former Nazis and fascists so long as they are anti-communist. Bishop Alois Hudal, father confessor to the German community in Rome and an active supporter of Hitler in the 1930s, helped hundreds of SS men on their way. Many years later, in his diaries, Hudal claimed to have helped Jewish refugees. One of the fugitives helped by this Nazi Scarlet Pimpernel was Franz Stangl the former commandant at Treblinka, the death camp near Warsaw, where a million people died. In 1945, Stangl had been arrested automatically as an SS officer, but his American interrogators were unaware of his past. After two years as a prisoner of war, Stangl was transferred to a prison in Linz in Austria. He escaped and made his way to Rome, where Bishop Hudal gave him an international Red Cross passport, a boat ticket from Genoa, and an entry visa to Syria. Stangl's final destination was Brazil, from where he was extradited to stand trial for war crimes in 1967. He was sentenced to life imprisonment and died a year later. After the new Jewish state of Israel defeated her Arab neighbors in the war of 1948, Syria had become an active recruiter of high-ranking SS men. Each one of them was an expert in genocide. Odessa provided the money and papers which enabled Walter Rauf, the inventor of the mobile gas chamber, to make his way to Damascus, the Syrian capital, where Odessa ran a number of safe houses. Rauf later settled in Chile, where in 1984, there was a demonstration outside his home led by the wife of the prominent French Nazi hunter, Serge Klasfeld. Ralph died in his bed the same year. Others were less fortunate. In March 1965, the Uruguayan police discovered the decomposing corpse of another war criminal, the Latvian Herbert Kukos, who was said to have personally supervised the murder of at least 30,000 men, women, and children. A far bigger fish than Kukos was Adolf Eichmann, the chief Gestapo official responsible for carrying out the final solution. Many of the transport orders to the death camps bore Eichmann's signature. After the war, Eichmann evaded capture and eventually made contact with Odessa. In May 1950, he was smuggled into Italy where a Franciscan priest, who was well aware of his true identity, gave Eichmann a passport in the name of Richard Clement and sent him to Buenos Aires. In 1960, thanks largely to the efforts of Simon Wiesenthal, Eichmann was kidnapped by Israeli secret agents and put on trial in Jerusalem. A small mountain of meticulously kept records and the testimony of survivors sealed Eichmann's fate. He was condemned to death for war crimes and executed on the 31st of May, 1962. 
One man who escaped Wiesenthal's net was Josef Mengele. In the spring of 1949, Odessa ferried Mengele to Argentina and a rendezvous with Hans Ulrich Rudel. Rudel represented many German firms in Argentina. One of his clients was the Mengele family company, which manufactured agricultural machinery. Rudel knew that the Helmut Gregor he welcomed in Argentina was the war criminal Mengele. Mengele lived here for a while. His circumstances were comfortable, and he made little or no attempt to conceal his own identity. But Mengele kept on the move. In 1959, Rudel helped Mengele obtain Paraguayan citizenship. Two years later, and in reduced circumstances, Mengele settled in Brazil. He lived on, undisturbed by Nazi hunters, but in failing health until the 5th of February, 1979. On that day, Mengele drowned after suffering a stroke while swimming in the sea at Bertioga Beach, 40 miles north of Sao Paulo. Without any great effort at concealment, he had evaded all attempts to hunt him down. At last, the smile had been wiped off the face of the great selector. In June 1985, the world's press gathered to watch an exhumation in a small town near Sao Paulo. The grave was that of one Wolfgang Gerhardt, but the body buried in it was that of Josef Mengele. Doggedly, Simon Wiesenthal refused to believe that his old enemy was no longer at large. But in 1992, DNA comparisons between blood taken from Mengele's corpse and samples provided by his family left British scientists 99.9% .9 certain that they could assure all survivors of the Holocaust and their families that Josef Mengele was dead. <laughs> 